you are enjoying Shannon Confidential, go ahead and look down and click that red subscribe button. I truly appreciate your support. Welcome to Shannon Confidential. I am Shannon, your host. And Shannon Confidential is a podcast about life, love, and everything in between. And we've talked to some spectacular people here on Shannon Confidential, and today is going to be no different. Today, our guest is Andre Wade. He is an author, a community activist, very, very involved in his community, and he'll go into all that. The book he is going to talk about today has been about 20 years in the making, and it's inspired from the events of 9 11. And it is called The Seven Ways to Disappear, the book within the book. Quite intriguing. He's got a blog. Sounds like a, it, it just, I can't wait to dive into it with him. So up next is Andre Wade. Okay, like I said, here he is, Andre Wade, the man of the hour, the writer, the, the, the incredible author, the community activist, the man, Andre Wade. Welcome to Shannon Confidential, Andre. Thank you for having me, Shannon. I appreciate it. I'm really excited about this. You've got a book, but the book that's in the book and a book that took 20 years to make. And like you have such a history of what led to this and where you are now with it. So I'm going to give you the floor and you tell us who is Andre Wade and how did you end up here? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I essentially am a Las Vegas native. I always have to throw that in there because we're really proud to be born and raised out here. Um, my trajectory really from uh, career background, which is human services. I've been in human services for more than 20 years, got a bachelor's in psychology and a, a master's in public administration. Um, but growing up, I one of my first jobs was working at Sam Goody and I spent seven years working in music stores. Um, there was a time when I started modeling and doing a little acting because I just wanted something to be different about my life. Cause I remember a professor asked me one day after class, like she was like, I really want to ask my, my students who are doing well, like, like what's up with them? So she was asking me if I traveled, if I was in any extracurricular activities, I didn't really have anything to say and I felt really small. So I decided to try like modeling and acting to give me something um, to do. And so all that sort of thing led me to going out to LA and eventually find myself in a writing group. and. September 11th happened. I used all of these things that sort of came up with the idea for Seven Ways to Disappear, the larger story, which um, the book within the book was born. Yeah. So first of all, I can totally see where you get the modeling, the acting. Yeah, <laughs> That's obvious. Uh, but when you say it's Seven Ways to Disappear, then it turned into the book within the book inspired by the events of 9-11. That right there is a conversation. So explain the Seven Ways to Disappear and then how it became a book within a book and how how long that process was to, you know, get it to paper and to what it turned into. Yeah, so again, living in LA, um, September 11th happened and it was a, the most strangest, saddest, scariest thing you can imagine waking up in the morning and seeing that um, on your television and not knowing what was happening. Yep. Um, and I remember, um, the following weekend, me and some friends decided to just go out per usual, even though we were kind of just like felt weird about it. But I remember having a conversation with someone in the bar that I didn't know, and he was just really impacted by September 11th, living in LA. He didn't know anyone in New York. No one was directly impacted that he knew of in his life. But the events made him really start to think about his life. He started to reevaluate things. I just thought it was really interesting that, not that 9-11 wasn't a big deal, but for someone that was so far removed from the actual events that he really started to just reevaluate his life. And it just made me think about the friends that I was with. Like we were friends and some of us were closer than others, but we weren't all that close. And so the story that I created out of it was um, about four friends in LA the week uh, before September 11th and how September 11th causes them anguish and they turn to a book um, to decide how they're going to disappear from their lives and the book within the book is that book that is passed around um, by the characters. Okay so <laughs> question number one are your characters based on your friends 
or loosely based? Or is it just loosely, four friends, so you did it on four people? You know, loosely based on friends, loosely based on parts of myself that I was trying to just process. Um, and they're just kind of based on what I imagine people in LA doing to start their career in different industries. So it uh, came from a lot of different sources. Okay. And seven ways to disappear. Is it, you know, fall off the face of the earth or do you say disappear as a reinvention of the new you? And that's where the book within the book comes from. Um, so it's this book called Seven Ways to Disappear for the characters um, that they find randomly like in a Urban Outfitters uh, book section and they pass it around from each other to each other and they each kind of take the information differently. This book that outlines seven ways that people literally metaphysically and symbolically disappear. And so at the end of the story as a plot device, they turn to this book um, to find out how they're going to disappear, either literally, symbolically, or metaphysically. It is so intriguing because just to wrap your head around the, the premise of the book, you're going, wait a minute, hot, what? So I can only imagine how, it, how long did it take to write this, or did it come in stages? When I first started writing it with... I was in a writing group and we used to meet about every Thursday. And so with writing groups, it helps you stay on track, accountability. And so it probably took about two and a half years to finish the first draft of the overall novel. And so I, it's been 20 years now. I still haven't completed said novel. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been more stopping than starting and keeping going on it, but I pick at it here and there. And so uh, during the pandemic is when uh, I decided to try to find a way to have a sense of accomplishment with this project. And I decided to pull the book within the book out uh, to publish that. Like I'd, I'd always wanted to, um, to give people in real life the experience that the characters have. But I also knew that out of context, it might be a little, it might take some mental gymnastics to kind of get to, to what I'm trying to do with the book within the book. Okay, so is the book within the book the one that's actually published now. Yes. This is your this is your first book, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, is this more or less? In other words, you're going to read this one first because you're still working on the book. I am. Is it a prequel? Does it help? Will it help you get to know these characters once you dive into said book when it is completed, or is it like a a flash forward and then the book will be their past? So initially, the idea was to release the novel first and then pull out the book within the book and have people in real life experience it. Since that didn't happen, I'm doing the reverse. And so it's the book within the book won't inform a reader about the larger story as it relates to the characters. Um, and so one will have to kind of just process the book within the book on their own. So when they finally read the entire story, they'll probably have a better connection with the characters because they would have already had a sense about the book within the book as the, the characters. Okay, so then tell us about, give us what the book within the book is. Tell us about the characters. What are they trying to do? I know you have uh, pretty beautiful ways to go inside yourself and, and reinvent yourself or, or just reevaluate life in general. So explain that. Yeah, so I initially when I started to have the idea that the character, there would be this book within the book, um, at first I thought I would just kind of outline um, like the chapters of what this book within the book would be. But then I realized that the reader would kind of need to know what the book is in its, in its entirety, which made me realize that um, this book within the book would have to be fleshed out. And, but I didn't really want to make it long and drawn out. So I just really wanted to keep it short and to the point as an add-on to the actual novel. And so the idea is that there is this book at like an Urban Outer Outfitters or anywhere, like a novelty bookstore, where you would find 
books like how to be a better gardener, how to have the perfect cocktail party, all these sort of things. But then if you're passing by and you see a title like Seven Ways to Disappear, you're gonna be like, huh, like what is that? Yeah. And so it's kind of subversive in that it's this fictional author who's taking it upon themselves to write these seven ways to disappear that now the characters are exploring, but it's very sort of out of context. You wouldn't think that something so sort of dark and mysterious would be in a story like that. And so it's just outlining these ways that we already kind of disappear from our lives. Um, again, either literally metaphysically or symbolically, symbolically uh, to really get people to realize that if we don't have strong connections with our, each other, ourselves, that almost anything can kind of distract us and cause us to disappear with, um, away from our, ourselves, even though we're living our lives each day. That's very true. And, and you're pretty specific on your seven ways to disappear. How, tell us what the seven ways are and how you came up with those specific seven ways. Uh, I've always been fascinated with the idea of just moving away, just wanting to start over, reset, like what would that be like? And if you do that and you do it well to where you don't let anyone else know about it, you are basically disappearing from people's lives and you're just creating your, your own new version of yourself, whatever that might look like. And so that's how I start off the, the book within the book with that um, way to disappear. But then there's also these other ways that we disappear where it's like through isolation. Like if I just sit home and I don't talk to anyone, I don't text anyone, there's no contact, then essentially I can disappear from people's yeah. like, life. Um, but there's also things like sleep. When we are depressed or if we want to get away from our problems, some of us go to sleep where we just disappear into sleep and so we don't have to deal with anything in our lives. Uh, but then it was also like the withdrawal of yourself. So if you are not present in your life, if you are just putting on a facade and not being your true self when you're with other people, you're really disappearing into yourself and you're not really exactly. there. And so I wanted to use all these ways as these interesting things that people do to disappear. And at one point I, I had invisibility and I was kind of thinking about like, oh, what if people had like an, you know, a certain cream they would put on their skin and disappear. I'm like, no, that's too far away from what I'm trying to get at. Comic book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was trying to come up with ways that people could kind of readily relate to. Physically, emotionally, yeah. Yes, yes. And it's very, so is this also, and excuse me if I use the wrong term, I'm just trying to, to get a full explanation of the book. Is it, it's not a, self-help as much as it is going to maybe encourage the reader to look into those seven ways. Yeah, it's definitely not a self-help. It's not a how-to guide. It's a work of, of fiction. And so people uh, should realize that. Um, but but you also let you it, kind of trip out through the book with the, with the characters. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so it's a way for people to think like, huh, like, Maybe they've, they've thought about this, maybe they haven't, maybe they can identify with all the different ways that are outlined. Um, but even in the, the larger story, the characters react differently. Like there's some people who are like, you know, it is what it is. Some people are like, oh, okay. And some people really gravitate to it. And like, it's like very profound and it's hard to them. And so I think that's really interesting in real life. Um, but it's also something that the characters experience. But at the end of the story, they all turn to the book regardless of how they feel about it, to figure out how they're going to disappear, to grapple with the, the feelings that they have. So do, are, do they then kind of wrestle the characters in the book once they're reading The Seven Ways to Disappear? Do you find that, will we find when we read, do they start wrestling with their own inner demons or inner issues, and then they go through their own personal transformation as they're going through the book, and, and each one of them is having a chance at reading it? Yeah, more or less, more or less. It's something that is in the background in the larger story. It's just there, but it doesn't become apparent until the very end where um, you realize that the book has had an impact on them more than they thought. Um, and so, yeah, and that's 
what it's trying to, to get at, that it's just subtly there, but when things got get tough, that's where they, they turn to for sort of answers. I have to tell you, you're, the, the, the book within the book is like a massive teaser <laughs> <laughs> for what's coming is, is the, how I'm hearing it. Is, does that sound about right? You know, that's what it's going to have to sound like because <laughs> that wasn't it's the like, intent. But it makes me realize that it's actually helping me to know that I need to work on the story and get it out sooner rather than later. So it's actually been uh, a great experience for me to kind of just make sure I get it done sooner rather than later and not have people just teased all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, so I know you, you were at the writer's club. You finally have this, the first part produced. You're officially an author. What, how has this uh, affected you? I am still processing it because this is something that uh, my 27 year old self came up with and my 47 year old self is giving it life and it's not in the way that I thought it would have come about, but it's a way for me to have a sense of completion, get a piece of work out in the world and have people react to it. And I just had a book launch event over, um, over the weekend and it went really well. And so right. I'm really just processing this whole experience um, and just in, enjoying it. And I feel very thankful and blessed that I can talk to you about um, something like this. And you're asking these great questions that just validates um, the work that I put out there, even though it might take some explaining, but um, at least I hope it's not bad writing. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm asking questions because it, it sounds intriguing. It makes me want to dive yeah. into it. And I, you said your 27 year old self to your 47 year old self is 20 years in the making, but sometimes life itself gives you wisdom. And do you think maybe your 27 year old self had you completed that this book 20 years ago? Do you think it's maybe you've just been able to add a little bit more now that you're completing it and, and seeing it through as your 47 year old self? 1000%. See, I don't think it's for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I agree. I, there's definitely a reason. And I truly believe that. Yes. <laughs> That's fantastic. So you said you had your, your first book launch. Do you have others planned? And, and if so, can, um, give us dates and locations and I'll make sure it's below us in the show notes so people can come meet you, buy a book, have it autographed, anything like oh, that. I, I appreciate that. We don't have another one yet. I think that if there is more interest that's built, um, I think we'll try to have another one. Um, but that's a really good question and thought. So thank you. No, you're welcome. And, and where can this book be found now? So in a variety of ways. So um, it's on online and, and on Amazon. And if one is adverse to Amazon, which some people are, um, uh, your online independent booksellers um, have the book. And I even just stumbled across it on Target. Target has it available online. Wow, you made it to Target. <laughs> I did, I did. And so, That's um, wonderful. So it's called Seven Ways to Disappear, the book within the book. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'll make sure everybody below us in the show notes, everything that Andre talks about today, because we're going to get into some more stuff, is going to be one click away below us in the show notes. I'll make sure you have access to everything, Andre. Um, and I'll, I'll put graphics up throughout this episode as well. Now, you have a blog. Yes. Now, explain the blog, because I went through it, and it's very, very interesting. You kind of little piece it, and then there's a Spotify playlist. Explain the blog. Yeah, so when I was going through the um, marketing process during self-publishing, uh, they suggested that uh, you start a blog. And I was like, a blog? Do people still blog these days? <laughs> and apparently they do. Um, and so I, w I decided I would use the blog as a way to provide background and context to seven ways to just appear the book within the book. And uh, once talking to a friend of mine, she suggested I have a playlist to go along with the, the book. And so I thought that was a fantastic idea and decided to curate songs that um, have the theme of disappearing or one of the seven ways to disappear. And so it's a mixture of different types of genre of music um, that I hope that people can enjoy perhaps as they're reading the book. So is the music kind of just in the background or is there certain songs that go with certain chapters? 
It's just in the, the background. I didn't want to get too specific with it. Um, however, in the, the larger story, um, is, which is really inspired by like Brett Easton Ellis, who um, wrote American um, Psycho and um, uh, a few other uh, books like Less Than Zero. And so throughout the, the book, there's a lot of pop reference pop culture references, including music. And so um, in that sense, there's a connection, a through line, but there are, the songs on a playlist are not exactly um, in the book, but it's still inspired by it. I, th- I have to say, when I saw that, I thought, well, now that's interesting. I've <laughs> never, I, and I love reading. I truly do. I, I'm just, my brain is like a sponge, but I've never had a playlist to go along with the book where they're, you know, the, the different songs are inspired by the themes of the book. I thought it was um, whoever told you to do that. That's brilliant. I agree. So yeah, and it, it helps to make it um, a multimedia sort of experience. You have the the book, you have the playlist, you have the blog. Um, I have some merchandise that I um, I'm producing, just like you know, anywhere from stickers to bookmarks to coffee mugs and t-shirts just to give it an overall um, experience. I love this. Now, where can, um, of course, like I said, everybody, I will have you linked up to Andre's blog as well. And the merchandise, I didn't, I didn't see that. What, where is that available? So I am behind on writing, updating my blog. So there's that. Um, I just recently uh, got the merchandise uh, created and haven't yet decided if it's something I'm going to sell or not, but definitely I'm going to be giving it out when I'm tabling at um, events and and whatnot. So I'm still going to figure out um, how to get the merchandise out to folks who might be interested. So it's uh, more to come. Okay, so the, your link to your blog, to your, uh, like I said, everything, Andre, will be below us in the show notes and I'll put graphics up. Now, besides for this, book teaser of this novel that's going to be coming out sometime soon. I'll just throw it out there. Uh, You're also uh, really big in your community activist. You have uh, different roles that you have. Why don't you tell us how involved you are in your community? Yeah, so I've been uh, in human services for uh, over 20 years. Um, Started off working in a group home. Now I'm state director for um, an LGBTQ plus civil rights organization. And I have the chance to make changes in Nevada with the help of some colleagues with policy and programs that we develop. And so, yeah, I've just been wanting to be a, a helper when it comes to people um, for my career. And it's, um, I've been able to do that in a lot of different roles and in a lot of different ways. So uh, what policies or, or, or changes have you made that benefit the different so, organizations? Yeah, so we have um, a piece of legislation that passed, uh, we call it HIV modernization, where it updates our HIV criminal laws, because essentially, um, out of all the communicable diseases, um, which HIV would fall into, um, it was the only one that had a felony enhancement if someone I trans, um, transmitted the virus intentionally or unintentionally, which really isn't a thing like people think. Um, but essentially, through a piece of legislation, we have it down to it's a, where it's a misdemeanor, just like any other communicable disease. Because what it does is stigmatize people living with HIV to think that they are worse off if they are accused of transmitting the, the disease, which again, is not a thing. It's really based on 1980s and 1990s way of thinking about HIV. And okay. with the modernization of laws or with um, science and medicine, we know that uh, a lot more about HIV. So that's one of the examples uh, that was changed. Okay. And did, what else are you working on? Because I find people who, first I'll ask, how did you get involved in the organization that you're, you're in now? What was the name of it? Uh, Silver State Equality. Can you say it a little slower? Silver State Equality. Okay. Now, what what is that? Explain what that is first. So it is a statewide LGBTQ plus civil rights organization here in Nevada. Um, our mission is to bring the voices of LGBTQ plus people to the institutions of power to create a world that is healthy, just, and fully equal. 
And we do that by passing poor quality laws, getting poor quality candidates elected to office. So we do endorsements of candidates. And then we provide, we provide education and advocacy. Wow, that's, that's full circle. How did you end up involved with this organization? Um, essentially, a friend of mine reached out and let me know that um, they were looking for a state director to start this organization. Um, we've only been around three and a half years. Okay. Um, we're a program of Equality California. And so I spoke to folks, interviewed, and started with them in January of 2019. And um, so I've been with them for almost four years now. Wow. And is this organization, um, do they have chapters or or parts in other states? So there are uh, about 40 some odd what we call equality groups throughout the nation. We are all um, different. We're not uh, like chapters or anything like that, uh, but doing similar work on different levels. There are some that are just one or two staff members. There's some that are up to 30, 40 staff members. Um, so we're all doing this work, but then there's a, a, a body called the Equality Federation that provides resources and support okay. to the different groups uh, throughout the states. Uh, that's wonderful. I, I, you know, everybody has beliefs or, you know, what have you in this world. I just believe just be true to who you are and be fair and be kind to all human beings. So I just love that there's organizations that wrap their arms around everybody, regardless of how they feel, think, and do. Yeah. That's all I can say, yeah. I just, I think everybody's, we're all human beings here. We're all just trying to get by. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Next up. You are quite the interesting man, Andre. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I, this is a, 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 a side of me that only close friends get to see. Now I'm sharing it with others. So. Oh, well, we are honored. You're, you're a super, super nice guy. Um, your friends that I know, Leticia, Desiree, everybody speaks so highly of you. Oh. So clearly you have a little following. Um, you know, and, it's, and, and I... I have so much appreciation for people who involve themselves in the community, even if it's just by volunteering, uh, being part of an organization, be a part of a board or a committee, because that is a huge commitment of time. And people need to appreciate those who go above and beyond to help others. And I commend you for that. Uh, that type of work, it takes a, a special heart and clearly you have it. So, you know, thank you for putting community first. Oh, well, my pleasure. Thank you for acknowledging it. Thank you. Yes. So do I dare ask, other than the actual novel, what's what else is out there for Andre Wade? Actually, it's a good question. It's a nice segue. Um, I am currently working on a nonfiction book, um, which is a collection of um, writings I've done related to my LGBTQ plus advocacy. So I've been uh, published in uh, some newspapers and magazines. Um, there's um, testimonies and speeches I've written around advocacy. So I am collecting those, compiling those um, to share with folks and little anecdotes around the different pieces, like what's happening in the world during a particular article that was written or maybe my life or career um, to really just give shape to the LGBTQ plus movement in Nevada um, over the past 15 years and, and sort of nationally uh, to hopefully give advocates, researchers, stakeholders um, information about messaging and um, strategy to get bills passed or get messages out about a particular issue. So I have a, um, a publisher who's interested in it. They just want me to make it longer. So I'm working on making it longer. And hopefully I can have it done by the end of this year. That's very exciting. And again, still taking what you do and paying it forward. And I, I, and I do have to ask, now that you've, you've dealt with legislation and trying to get laws passed or things changed, is it a slow process? Do you, do you have to play the game? How, how does one do that? Because it just seems so challenging. It's one of the things that I love most about my job. Uh, because you, like a policy is basically like where you're trying to implement behavior change and you kind of base it upon like research or what other states have done. And so 
you take something that's kind of nebulous and you create language in a bill, which is one thing, uh, but then you have to translate it down into bite-sized bits to summarize and give information. So when you're talking to legislators, stakeholders about it, like it's easily to be easily understood. And so the whole process can take about a year to come up with the bill, do the research, uh, build support for it before you go into a, the legislative session, which for us is 120 days. And so um, once the legislative session starts, it's it, you just hit the ground running. But uh, before that, it's a lot of groundwork to, uh, again, do the research um, and build support for, for the bill. But it's uh, one of the things that, again, I love the, the most because um, the whole process is interesting, but I will say getting a law passed is one thing, but and implementing it is a completely different beast. <laughs> yeah, uh, people don't realize the time and effort um, before all of a sudden everybody hears, oh, here we've made this change. There is so much background work before that actually happens. And that's the that's why we have people like you that that step up and and do this because it's not easy. It's not, it's not. And there are many checks and balances along the way to where um, a bill can be quote unquote killed. And so if you make it over these hurdles um, and there's many of them, then the payoff is it being signed into law by the governor. But there are many times along the way where it could just go sideways and not happen. Wow. I'm very happy that people have you looking out for them and, and going to bat for them and making changes that are necessary and needed and, um, and enjoying it at the same time. Yes. Well, you know, someone like you who is giving platform to people and their ideas to share about themselves and their work, um, it's equally important and equally a lot of work. And without folks like you, like we're not able to get our ideas out there. And so got to thank you for providing space for folks like me. We are very welcome, Andre. Uh, I have to say, you've been a fabulous guest. Everything you've talked about, what you do for your community, uh, your, your writing, you're going to do additional writing, still completing the novel. This is just a great big teaser of Andre Wade because uh, there's going to be a lot to read in the future. Yes, fingers crossed. We're going to make it happen. <laughs> well, you've now said it publicly, so I'm holding you to it. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of just announced it. You have no choice now. <laughs> Fair. That makes well, sense. Yeah. Well, when the book is completed or the, the, the new writings that you're putting together is extended and uh, finished, I would love to have you back. Um, let everybody know where you are at that point in your life and uh, to let everybody know that the the newest writings from Andre Wade are available. Oh, I'd appreciate that so much. Absolutely. Well, Andre, thank you so much for being on Chat and Confidential. I knew this was going to be interesting. You did not disappoint. And um, I just really appreciate your time. And I look forward to seeing what the future holds for you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for the kind words and the interesting questions. That helps a lot. And it even gets me to think about things I haven't thought of. So thank you. You're very welcome. Thank <laughs> you.